and all of your causes are so special to me. And Snapper's right, I do take my job personally. <laughs> um, I want to thank a few people in the audience. Um, I want to thank Councilwoman Del Pepper, who's right here. I want to thank Councilwoman Amy Jackson, who's right over there. I want to thank former Mayor Allison Silverberg, who's sitting right there. I want to thank candidate for clerk of the court, Greg Parks, who's over there. Anyone else? I think I'm good. Um, I, uh, I, I have so much love for the people, for all of you, really. I mean, I know all of you in the audience, too. It's not just the people on this stage. And um, I've long believed, I have to tell, I just, so I've been a citizen activist for decades. And the thing that annoyed me most about politicians was when you go to them and you express a problem to them, and I had lots of issues I've been fighting for, and they say, yeah, yeah, it's a really good issue, and then you never hear from them again. So it's always been my goal to answer the call when people call for me, and to work hard, and to not take no for an answer. And sometimes I succeed, and sometimes I haven't succeeded yet. But I believe that you never fail if you never give up. And uh, all these causes are very, very dear to me. All these people are very, very dear to me. And um, I just don't think we should give up. We are at an historical moment in America right now. Uh, Jerry Nadler, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, called it a constitutional crisis. I agree with him. I know Jerry Nadler well, actually. I used to work for Barney Frank, many of you know, on the House Judiciary Committee. And um, I have a lot of faith, actually, and respect for, for Congressman Jerry Nadler. We are at one of those points where I think sometimes when you're in the middle of it, you know you're in the forest, you don't see the forest, you just see the individual trees. We're at a crisis point in America right now. And being the historian, not as good as MacArthur Myers. No one's as good a historian as MacArthur Myers. But, but being a student of history, I've thought about other historic moments in American history. I was thinking about three elections that I considered as, as important as 2020. I'll get to 2019 in a minute. And the three elections I thought of were 1800, 1860, and 1932. So in 1800, the country is just a few decades old. The Bill of Rights is nine years old. And our president, John Adams, sorry, Abigail, I do not, I'm not a fan of John. Our president, John Adams, signs into law the Sedition Acts. And he takes journalists who oppose the president of the United States and they put them in jail. We did that in America. You'd say, well, that violates the First Amendment. I know, but the Supreme Court was new then. Marbury versus Madison had been decided yet. No one stopped him. He starts taking people who opposed his administration and putting them in jail until the great election of 1800, which was a knockdown, drawn out, angry election where Jefferson barely wins, gets rid of the Sedition Act, protects the First Amendment. Then, of course, the election of 1860. The country is about to fall into civil war. You have southern states who in order to, they want to expand slavery. They don't just want to keep it in their states, they want to expand slavery. And they're willing to fight and die to enslave other Americans. And there are four candidates in that election. And by the time Abraham Lincoln wins that election, before he even gets into office, seven states have seceded. And a lot of folks in the North are saying, you know what, let them go. Not Abraham Lincoln, right? I mean, that talk about an election that changed America. More people died in the American Civil War than all of our wars put together. And it was worth the fight. Lincoln said, we cannot live half enslaved, half free. And um, well, we're a free country today. Another reason why I want to get that damn name off that damn highway. That wonderful highway, it'll be Richmond Highway. 1932. Economic crisis, Great Depression. Herbert Hoover's making all the wrong economic moves. And 
corporations, rich people speculating the stock market, they're very rich and then their failure causes the whole country to collapse. We actually had a similar collapse in 2008. Thank God we had a President Obama who knew what to do or it could have been worse than the Great Depression. But in 1932, it wasn't clear what was gonna happen. Over in Germany, fascism is getting started. When people are desperate, when people are suffering, when people have great economic privation and their massive unemployment, they often look for a scapegoat, right? That's what happened in Europe. And don't think that we in America, that we in America are exempt from fascism. There was a guy on the radio, Father Charles Coughlin, priest, who preached fascism, who preached anti-Semitism, who preached hatred, who preached scapegoating. And there was a lot of support in America for the Nazis in the 1930s, even heroes like Charles Lindbergh. And Franklin Roosevelt came in in that election, won in a landslide, and showed people that good government, good policies, allowing ordinary people to have a chance could take away all these crazy ideas of blaming others for our economic misfortune. Started regulating corporations, making sure that they obey the laws. Critical election. So here comes 2020. What do we have? We have a president who calls the press the enemy of the people. Reminds me of John Adams. We have a president who's appealing to white supremacy and doing his best to separate us, to put it in warring camps, to get us to hate each other, bragging about which side has more guns, actually encouraging violence, reminding me of 1860. And we have a president who's all about helping corporations harm ordinary people, helping massive multinational corporations get rich with a massive corporate tax cut while ordinary people are getting poorer and poorer. In 2019, 1% of America owns 40% of the nation's wealth. The top 5% have two-thirds of the nation's wealth. Top 10% has 80%. Top 20% has 90% of the entire wealth of the whole country. 50%, half of all Americans own practically nothing. Living paycheck to paycheck. And I remember 1932. So to me, what's going on in America combines the three most important elections in our history, and we face them all. We face them all in 2020, along with the constitutional crisis that Congressman Nadler was talking about, that we have a president who says, I'm not gonna obey the Constitution, which you know I always carry with me, right? And the Virginia Constitution. Um, but I'm just not going to obey it. Congress, you want a subpoena? No, I'm not going to do it. And I'm nervous. Because whereas the Constitution is the Constitution and the court should uphold the Constitution, President Obama didn't get to choose the nominee he was allowed to choose under the Constitution for the first time in American history. I mean, the Constitution says the president has the right to nominate a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, the Senate can reject them, but it doesn't say the Senate can never hear one. That had never been done in 200 plus years. And now I'm worried there's a bunch of toadies on the Supreme Court. I'm very worried about our country. And I know y'all are too. I know everyone in this room is too. 2020 will be, I think, like 1800, 1860, 1932. But here's the thing. We in Virginia and only in Virginia, we get a head start on 2020. No one else in the nation gets this. We are one of four states that have elections in 2019 and the only state in the country where we can flip the House and the Senate in Virginia, the only state in the country, the country is looking to us in Virginia to set the marker for 2020. We've done it before. In 05, we had a great election in Virginia. In 06, Democrats take the House of Representatives. In 09, we had a terrible election in Virginia. Our governor, gubernatorial candidate barely got over 40%. Republicans come in in 2010, sweep the House, sweep state legislators, gerrymander so many states so badly we're still suffering from it today in 2019. 
And then, of course, the miracle of 2017, which those of you who know me know I worked very hard for. Many of you in this room, practically all of you, worked very, very hard for. We said, you know, I, I said, if we get 10 delegates, I'll be thrilled. And we got 15. Actually, we got 17. We got the majority. Josh Cole was treated. Shelly Simons was cheated. That, we'll go back there another day. We lost the uh, pull out of the hat, the, the bowl. But then, after our tremendous success in 2017, we took the House in 2018. The only reason why the President of the United States has any kind of oversight right now is because of a Democratic House of Representatives that came there because people had all the momentum from our Virginia elections. Here's the thing. I remember November 2017. I remember people were still angry and upset over the election of 2016. You all know these people. We are these people, right? Oh my God, he's doing this. Oh my God, he's doing this. Oh my God, this is terrible. This is horrible. This is awful. And you'll want to go and pull the covers over your head and never come out of bed. And I hear this all the time from my friends. Oh my God, Mark, did you see he did this? Did you see he did this? It's terrible. And it is terrible. They're not wrong. They're not wrong intellectually. I do think they're wrong emotionally. When bad things happen, you can crawl under the covers and you can be upset and you have every right to cry. But it doesn't solve anything. Every single person on this stage was confronted with a difficult problem. And none of them sat home and said, they, every single person on the stage was told, you can't do this. You can't, it's not done that way. I've been told a thousand times in my life, Mark, it's just not done that way. I don't listen to those people. And that's why I need your help. We can win in Virginia in 2019. We can set the stage for America in 2020. We are this close. And so I, I need your help. I actually think the Virginia Senate's gonna be okay. We got 19 Democrats there, none of them are in danger. And uh, I think the Senate's actually gonna be pretty easy. We got five people going. My, my colleagues in the Senate might not like me telling you this, but really, the battle is where I sit. It's in the Virginia House of Delegates. We need two seats. Three of our delegates are becoming, becoming senators. Love all three of them, but that means we have five seats. And actually, um, is Dorothea in the room? No? Is she there? Oh, well, Alex, Alex actually, is a, he's, a big, he's a big canvasser. Um, Lot Holly uh, at, at Lynn. I, w we've had... A lot of people, and now it's the Democratic Party, Arlington, Arlingtonians work very, very, very hard. This is our year. This is a year to make a difference. Many of you know um, I have a Republican opponent for the first time. It's kind of fun for me. I'd much rather fight a Republican than a Democrat. Uh, much rather, much rather. Um, so I'll probably send out one mail piece to, to just remind people to vote because this is a year. I may be the only contested Alexandrian on the ballot in November. But the vast majority of funds I'm raising and I've committed to our caucus to raise a lot of money, they're not going to me. They're going to protect my friends, people like Wendy Goditis and Hala Ayala, and pr protecting the seats that we gained and getting us two more, people like Dan Helmer, Josh Cole. So I'm gonna ask all of you who can afford it, if you can contribute a little bit more, I hate asking for money, but it's not for me. It's for the cause, it's for the country. And encourage your friends who aren't in this room, who you know can afford it, not the ones who can't, but the ones who can't afford it, maybe some in that top 1% that got 40% of the nation's wealth. Contribute to the cause, contribute to Mission 51. We can do this. In 2017, everyone was depressed about Donald Trump, but after November, they were like, wow, look at what Virginia did. We can beat this guy. And then, oh my God, did we get to work in 2018. In Virginia, just think about it. We had, four out of 11, they, they were, we had four out of 11 seats in Congress. Now we got seven out of 11. That's amazing. We can do it in 2020, but the road goes through the House of Delegates in 2019. So if you can canvas, help me canvas. If you can contribute, yeah, help, help contribute. But I am excited, not just about helping all these people, I'm excited what we can do about guns. 
to make sure that we're not flooded with people who shouldn't be having guns, having guns, shooting up our schools. I'm excited about health care. We can dramatically reduce health care costs right here in Virginia. I'm excited about the Equal Rights Amendment. I'm excited about a firm LGBT non-discrimination law, rainbow rights that I put forward every single year, but give us a majority and we're going to pass. I'm excited about education. I'm excited about what we can do for, for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence. I'm excited to finally get the bill to help Yolanda and Mike and, and, and Matt and, and Liz. We can do so much with just two more seats. So I want to thank you all, everyone here for coming, for listening. I know it's been a little bit long. Don't go out and enjoy a little bit of food. Um, but help me, help us we can change Virginia, we can change America. Every time you know who does you know what, don't get mad, get even. All right, thank you everyone for coming.